Good morning, everybody. It's uh, time for us to go ahead and get started for the day. So good to have everyone here today. Um, good to see us be able to join together uh, and fellowship and, and catch up. Uh, but we're going to enter into our uh, time of, of worship with one another. And uh, we're going to open up with As the Deer. This is what in the youth group we call the, the new version. Um, so it doesn't go as, as the one that we sometimes sing. It's not, I think we've, I'm pretty sure we've sung it here before. But just so you don't start singing the older version and get thrown off. This is the new version. Let's sing. As the deer thirsts for the water, Lord. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Our holy, almighty God, creator and sustainer of all things, one who sees and knows all things and yet is our father and our friend, we come before you this morning as your people. And Father, we pray that we might have a heart that seeks after you. Father, that our lives may be drawn deeper into you and your ways. And we pray that during this time together that your spirit would continue to work on us, continue to 
bring us closer to you. Help us to love and encourage each other to your good works. Uh, and build us up as your people. And Father, we just pray that during this time that we may see not only you, but each other. Uh, and be called to the life of love more deeply uh, that you've brought us into through Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's sing, This Is My Father's World. This is my Father's world. going to sing burdens are lifted at calvary as we uh, prepare to have the lord's supper together um, as just a reminder that as this is a time that we uh, focus and we think about the the death and resurrection of our savior um, and and really what that means for us of what he went through uh, that we also think about what it means for us uh, and that it's because of what uh, jesus has done for us at calvary that our burdens are lifted uh, that not only are the burdens of our sins lifted off of us, but that we are also brought into the family of God, that we are also surrounded uh, by people who love him and, and love each other. Uh, and so as we sing this, let's reflect not only on the cross, uh, but also what that means for the whole of our lives. Days are filled with sorrow and
Anybody need one of the little chalices? If so, Derek will get you one. Just raise your hand. This morning, um, I'd like to focus on Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. At one time, we too acted like fools. We didn't obey God. We were tricked. We were controlled by all kinds of desires and pleasures. We were full of evil. We wanted what belongs to others. People hated us, and we hated one another. But the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. It wasn't because of the good things we had done. It was because of his mercy. He saved us by washing away our sins. We were born again. The Holy Spirit gave us new life. God poured out the Spirit on us freely. That's because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, had done. His grace made us right with God, so now we have received the hope of eternal life as God's children. For me this morning, those words are powerful because that set of verses explains all of us here every day. There are desires we can't control sometimes. There are thoughts we have. We argue with each other. We get upset. We uh, slander one another or we're greedy or uh, any number of things. But those set of verses remind us this morning that it's nothing that we've done that gives us the hope of eternal life with our Savior and, and our Lord Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice. If you would, pray with me. Father, this morning we thank you so much for the ability to come here and worship you and spend time with one another as imperfect as we are, Father. And we want to thank you so much for Jesus' sacrifice that allows us the grace for lives often not lived the way that we should. Father, this morning we ask that you would help us keep our minds in the right spot to focus on that sacrifice as we take these emblems that represent Jesus' sacrifice. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we come to you again as we prepare to drink of the cup that represents Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross for us. We thank you so much for his willingness to obey the commands that you had given him, even though sometimes it was hard. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We also take this time to set aside from the, the Lord's Supper, but to have the opportunity to uh, give back for all the blessings that, that the Lord has bestowed on us. Um, up there on the screen is all the different ways that you can, you can give. Um, will you bow with me as we pray for the offering? Lord, we, we come to you humbly thanking you for the blessings that we have, both big and small. The blessings range greatly, but uh, we live in, in a country and, and in an area that we get to worship you freely without fear. We get to uh, enjoy um, a lot of things that others don't. Father, we ask that this morning that uh, as we give, that we can do so with cheerful hearts, that we can uh, remember that, that that which we have is not ours, but it's yours, and it's your blessings that uh, have bestowed on us what we have, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
During this time, we're going to uh, dismiss those that go to Cal time. So if you would mind uh, standing, if you're able to, for the next song uh, as they make their way down the hall. Uh, we're going to sing How Sweet, How Heaven. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight on those that love the Lord. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Please turn your Bibles to John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Good morning, family. If you would, I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to the letter of 1 John. Letter of 1 John, and I'll make my way there, kind of roundabout. You know, a Jewish expert in their religious law tried to entangle Jesus in an ongoing religious debate. The rabbis had calculated somewhere in the neighborhood of 613 commands within the law of Moses. And since the violation of some of those commands carried a heavier, heavier penalty than others, they had been in this debate over which one of the commands were greater than the others. Now when you're trying to get someone on record, it, that's an age-old method of entrapment. After all, if they don't take a stand, if they equivocate, you can charge them with being wishy-washy and evasive. But if they do take a position, then no matter which position they take, they're going to alienate people on the other side of the debate. Jesus didn't care. He waded right into the controversy with eyes wide open and no equivocation. Back in the Gospel of Matthew in the 22nd chapter, we read that hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now since love for God and love for others are the unifying elements of every one of the 613 commands that the rabbis had tabulated in what we erroneously call the Old Testament, it should not surprise us that the Apostle Paul, when describing the nine elements that make up the fruit of the indwelling spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the first quality he listed was love. To borrow the language of Colossians 3, 14, love binds everything together. In a way, love is like the rind of an orange. The rind holds together everything that we associate with an orange, such as the segments and the juice sacs and the seeds and the pips and the pulp. In like manner, love binds all the facets of the fruit of the Spirit together. So what are some of the key truths the Holy Spirit teaches us in Scripture about this character quality that binds everything together? Now there are many places we could go in Scripture in many ways to address the subject of love, but I want to take a walk through 1 John, primarily chapters 3 and 4. And if I could summarize what the Holy Spirit says in this letter, love is the evidence. Evidence of what? It's evidence that we have eternal life. It's evidence that our faith is genuine. It's evidence for God. Evidence for Jesus. And this morning, we'll look at the first one. Love as the evidence for eternal life. Now, we call ourselves Christians. Basically means Christ follower. We've come to Christ because we recognize that we are abject failures and sinners. And we know we need saving, and we know that Jesus is the only one who can do it. Yet many of us struggle with the question of whether or not we have genuinely been saved. It happens all the time. I'll be in a Bible class with a bunch of veteran Christians and I'll ask, how many of you, when Jesus comes back, hope you'll be saved? And the hands kind of, you know, I say, how many of you know it? When he comes back, you know you'll be saved. Isn't that tragic? That we struggle with the confidence that we have already received eternal life. And of course, one of the reasons we struggle with that confidence is because we know what losers we are. We know how often we fall down and we fail and we fall short and we think, this isn't how it ought to be. Well, the Apostle John wanted to assure the Christians he was writing to of their salvation. In summarizing the content and the purpose of this letter, over in chapter 5, verse 13, John wrote, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. But how can we know that we've got the eternal life God offers us in Jesus Christ? Well, one answer is we can know by seeing the evidence of the love for others that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. Back up to chapter 3, verse 14, and listen carefully and soberly to these words. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life. How? What does this passage say? How do we know that we have passed from death to life? Well, the rest of the sentence says, because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. 
How do we know that we've passed from death to life? How do we know that we have eternal life? Because we love each other. Right? We love each other. Right? Do we? This passage presents loving one another as a matter of spiritual life and death. It proves whether or not we've passed from darkness to light. Just a couple of paragraphs earlier, the apostle wrote back in chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. Over in the Gospel of Matthew, the 12th chapter, 33rd verse, Jesus said that a tree is known by its fruit. How do we know an apple tree from a pear tree? Of course, there are many ways to do that, but the easiest way is just to look at the fruit, right? How do we know a pear tree is alive and healthy? Well, we look to see if there are buds and leaves, blossoms, and ultimately the presence and the quality of its fruit, right? How do we know if we, as individual believers, and collectively as a congregation, how do we know if we as individuals and as a church family are alive and healthy? We look for the fruit. The fruit of love. Remember 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Let me read a longer section of the text, and I pray that you and I will listen to the Holy Spirit's words attentively and with self-reflection. I'm going to back up to chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 10. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Did you hear again how love of one another is proof that we're God's children? The absence of love for each other means, I didn't say it, he said it, means we're the children of the devil and spiritually dead. To drive home the seriousness of his point, John cites two examples. The apostle takes us back to the earliest portions of the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Sometime after Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden, they had two sons. Both sons brought offerings to God. But one, his name was Cain, and he was a farmer by trade, was indifferent to God. And that was evident from what he brought. 
Instead of honoring God with the best of his produce, he gave God leftovers. Probably Brussels sprouts. That's my theory. His brother Abel, who was a shepherd, honored God by bringing the best of his flock. Now, God accepted Abel's offering, but understandably rejected Cain's. Now, resentment began to build within Cain's heart. God tried to warn him not to let it fester. But Cain wouldn't listen. Resentment boiled into hatred, and hatred exploded into the murder of his brother Abel. If we claim to be Christ followers, but in our attitudes and in our actions we allow resentment, animosity, discord, factionalism, slander, gossip, self-centeredness, if we let these things fester in our hearts, all of which are acts of hatred toward others, selfishness is an act of hatred toward others, you're putting yourself in front of everybody else. If we let that fester in our hearts, such fruit shows that we are more like Cain than Christ. And by the way, rather than randomly pulling those negative thoughts and actions out of thin air, I lifted them from the works of the flesh described in Galatians 5 and Colossians 3. Don't forget the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. That's where John got the concept that hatred towards another is essentially murder. You've murdered that relationship. You've killed that relationship. When we let anger or resentment kill our relationship with a brother or sister in Christ, like Cain, we're guilty of murder. John then reminds us that the opposite of Cain is Jesus Christ. By way of refreshers, here again, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus is the embodied definition of what it means to love others. His own actions demonstrate that the essence of love is self-sacrifice for others. And let me ask you this. When Jesus laid down his life for every person in the world, it was because we were such nice people. He thought, you know, everybody on this planet I've met, they are just so wonderful. They are just so gracious, so sweet, so nice, so friendly, so helpful. I think I'll die for them. Is that how it went? No. Remember Romans 5, when we were God's sinning, ungodly enemy. He showed his love for us by Christ dying for us. He didn't wait till we straightened up. He didn't wait till we showed a sweet disposition. He died for us and we'd done nothing to merit that sacrifice. Jesus himself said, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Does Jesus love you in spite of all your flaws and sins and faults? Then should we not love each other in spite of all our sins and flaws and faults? Love each other as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, Jesus went on to say, to lay down one's life for one's friends, John 15, 12 through 13. As I pointed out in last week's lesson, we would be wrong to think that this self-sacrificial love, which is kind of a redundant expression, I know, but we would be wrong to think that this self-sacrifice is only about shedding our blood for someone else. Back in John's letter, chapter 3, right after telling us in verse 16 that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, the apostle gives an example of one way we do that, one way we lay down our lives. Because immediately after he says we ought to lay down our lives for one another, he says, for if anyone, verse 17, has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? When someone's in need and you don't care, how can you say you got the love of God for that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. British theologian Christopher Wright observes from this passage, 1 John 3, 17, that simple, ordinary, everyday opportunities to show real practical generosity, care, and kindness is the type of self-sacrifice that John is describing. And the pity in this passage is not simply feeling sorry for someone's plight. It refers to taking concrete action to take care of the other's need. Jesus' brother James put it this way in James 2, 14 through 16. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? James then calls the lack of concrete action evidence that someone's faith is dead. So the presence of a concrete, self-sacrificing love for others is evidence that a believer and a congregation is alive and that the believer has eternal life. One of the most powerful stories told by Jesus, illustrating self-sacrificial love for others, is found in Luke chapter 10. It's a story familiar to most of us, even non-Christians, who, though they may not know all the details of the story, have heard of the main character, someone we've called the Good Samaritan. Now, you remember the Jewish religious expert we encountered at the beginning of this message? The one who tried to entrap Jesus? Well, there's more to that encounter. Luke 10, beginning verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? The religious expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. I'm going to pause right here. Do this. Part of the daily practice of a devout Jew today and back then is to recite the Shema every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So this is something this religious expert recited, probably already recited at least once that day. And Jesus said, hey, that's good. Do it. It's not enough to recite it. You can mouth the words all you want to. But the proof is in the pudding, as they say. It's the doing 
that proves you got it. That you are hearing, that you are listening. So, the religious expert wanted to entrap Jesus in his own words. I mean, after Jesus said, yeah, that's good, now do it. The guy tried to justify himself by saying, but who's my neighbor? Jesus' reply had put this so-called expert on the spot. You want eternal life? Love your neighbor. But like so many of us, the specialist in Jewish religious law wanted to justify himself. Think about this. How does putting boundaries around the meaning of neighbor justify or prove the religious expert morally right? Well, consider the context, the cultural context. There was a prevailing attitude in Jesus' day, and it's still with us today, that says, you shall love your neighbor, but hate your enemy, Matthew 5, 43. Has that philosophy changed much over the last 2,000 years? Love your neighbor, but hate that jerk who stabbed you in the back, that idiot at the office who's always taking credit for what you've done, the boss who fired you, you, the neighbor who weed whacked your petunias. Isn't that philosophy still with us today? Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. In the writings of the Jewish sect that left us the famous Dead Sea Scrolls found near Qumran, Among the things the teacher of righteousness was to communicate to new members of the sect was love all the children of light, each commensurate with his rightful place in the counsel of God. Hate all the children of darkness, each commensurate with his guilt and the vengeance due him from God. That's from the rule of community. And it's evident when you read the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls that the children of light are the members of the Qumran sect often identified as the Essenes. And everyone else, even fellow Israelites, were children of darkness. Thus for them, neighbor would be narrowly defined as members in good standing of one's denomination or sect. If I were to transpose that to this time, you know, That means we have to love other Church of Christers. But we don't have to love Baptists. We don't have to love Catholics. That's the teaching of the Qumran sect. Their definition of neighbor was members of your own little group. Love members of your own little group. You don't have to love anybody else. Consider a few lines from a book written by a religious expert about a century before Jesus' time. If you do good, know to whom you do it. Do good to the devout, and you'll be repaid, if not by them, certainly by the Most High. Give to the devout, but do not help the sinner. Do good to the humble, but do not give to the ungodly. It's from a work known as the Wisdom of Sirach, chapter 12. So with that background, recall from the Gospels how the religious experts protested loudly and were deeply offended by the way Jesus treated the social outcasts, the pariahs, the sinners, how he treated them with human dignity and compassion. And they were offended by that because those were not your neighbors. They might live next door, but they're not your neighbor that you have to love. To the religious expert that asked Jesus this question, his neighbor was the person just like him, a devout Jew of the same or better social class, of the same or better economic status, and of the same religious party or denomination. Honestly, it isn't much of a challenge to practice neighborly behavior toward those who are your clones. 
those who are in your close circle of associates. Jesus said as much in Luke 6, 32 and 33, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners do that. That's the beauty of legalism, of emphasizing the letter of the law over the spirit of the law. You can define a term so narrowly that it's virtually impossible for you to violate it, creating loopholes big enough to drive a truck through. The religious expert testing Jesus was seeking to vindicate his narrow definition of neighbor and his uncharitable attitude toward those not of his social and religious class. He was willing to practice the command to love God and love your neighbor, but he wanted to set limits, to draw lines, to establish boundaries to the application of this law of love. In response to the religious expert's self-justifying question regarding who qualifies as a neighbor, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. But he didn't mention the Samaritan first because that would have been a spoiler alert. If I may summarize what some of you remember from Sunday school, there was this man traveling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about 15 or so miles, and it drops somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 feet over that 15 miles. It's a steep road. And not only is it steep, but it's winding, and it goes through narrow ravines and canyons, traversing the wilderness of Judah. Generally, it's not wise to travel that road alone, as the man in the story found out. Bandits assaulted him, robbed him, and they left him naked and half dead on that desert road. As luck would have it, a priest soon came along the road. He saw the victim laying there, and what did he do? It's okay, you can talk. Wake up. He, you know, kind of, then hurried on his way, walked around him, left him there. Now, I don't know why he did that. Could have been anything from personal safety. I mean, when you've got a bloodied, half-dead guy laying there in the road, that does kind of suggest this may not be the safest neighborhood, doesn't it? And frankly, he could be bait. The people who did that to that guy may still be lurking around, hoping you'll stop long enough for them to jump out and do the same to you. Don't we sometimes move on out of concern for our personal safety? And not only that, he's a priest. If this guy who's half dead goes all the way dead on him while he's tending to him, then he has become unclean and must be isolated for a week. And that's terribly inconvenient. So off he goes. Now not long after the priest skirted the victim, a Levite came by. Now these the guys who assisted the priests in the temple. And the Levite did the same thing, just skirted the guy and hurried on past, perhaps for similar reasons. Finally along came a Samaritan. Let me ask you, do you watch the international news? Are you aware of how Jews and Palestinians in the Middle East get along? There is hatred and violence that has been passed on from one generation to the next. And frankly, the hands on both sides are dirty. It's visceral on both sides. Well, that's how it was between the Jews and the Samaritans in the first century. 
So along comes this character whom the religious Jesus was telling the story to would instinctually loathe. And what does this despised Samaritan do? He risks his own life. He lays down his life for this stranger. How does he do that? Well, by stopping for one which puts him at risk if the bandits are still in the neighborhood. And then he breaks into his own supplies, gets out his first aid kit, and does triage on this complete stranger who is more than likely a Jew and thus his mortal enemy. Do you know how hard it is to lift a, a limp body? I mean, this is one of the reasons protesters just kind of go all noodly on the police officers, so it's harder to carry them off as opposed to someone who can help or someone who's, who's rigid. But you've got this guy who's practically unconscious, so he's, just, he's limp, and he's covered in sweat, and he's covered in blood, and the Samaritan gets down there, and he's trying to get a hold of this guy, and he's struggling to get up, and he puts, it on, puts the man on his own ride struggling to get him up there. This wasn't an easy thing to do. But he takes the time to do that. Then, he takes the victim to an inn. There were no hospitals. He takes the victim to an inn, asks the innkeeper to take care of the guy, tend to his wounds, make sure he gets better, gives the innkeeper a wad of cash to cover and says, I'm coming back to check on him, and I'll make good if you had to spend more. All of this for a complete stranger. After telling the story, Jesus looked at the squirming religious expert and turned his question around. Not, who is my neighbor, but who proved to be the neighbor to the victim? The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan. The religious expert couldn't even bring himself to say the ethnicity of the character. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus replied again, go and do the same. The Samaritan laid down his life for this victim. He demonstrated through his concrete actions what God intended when he commanded us to love our neighbor. A neighbor is anyone who needs help. Anyone who needs help. Whether you like them or not. Whether they're from your group or not. Whether they're your enemy or not. When we read that the fruit of the Spirit is love, the story of the Samaritan illustrates what that looks like. So we ought to go and do the same. Such love is evidence that we are the children of God and we have eternal life. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Well, family, I have myself hoarse. Working on this message. I was convinced. in need of a visit, 
in need of a call, in need of some help moving things, and I didn't do it. And I didn't do it because I couldn't do it. I didn't do it because I didn't want to. I was already in the middle of something else. I didn't want to stop in the middle of the project I was working on. I didn't want to stop. You know, I'm fixing a sermon on love here. I don't have time for you. Find somebody else to love you. I was just too tired. I was too tired. You know, it's been a long day. I'll, I'll call you some other time. Waiting until I'm rested and got nothing to do and feel better and to help somebody. It's a relationship of convenience. Standing up here, well, as I was preparing this lesson, as I'm standing up here delivering it to you, the words are like ash in my mouth. Because I'm not. you must to do better but I'm also not very good at keeping promises I would covet your prayers that I would not walk around you when you're in need. That I would not step over you and keep going when you're dealing with something and could just use somebody to listen or somebody to help in any way. I would covet your prayers that the Holy Spirit would live in me and transform me and help me produce the fruit of the Spirit, starting with love. That's what I ask of you, the need this morning. And I appreciate you listening, family. Here we cut the live feed. Be nice if we cut it just.